No, I'm not doing it. I'm not going back. What's the point, anyway? They just keep making terrible musicals. I mean, do we really need a modern remake of Annie? It wasn't that great a show the first two times they made a movie out of it. I've had it. So I'm going to kick back with one of my favorite musicals and one of the most successful stage-to-screen transfers of all time, The Music Man. Ah, The Music Man. Just thinking about it makes me smile. From the first words of Rock Island to the last reprise of 76 trombones, every bit of Meredith Wilson's score is a gem. The story is a good old-fashioned musical comedy yarn populated by a host of memorable characters. And Morton DeCosta's 1962 film perfectly captures the charm of this slice of Americana. Performed by a stellar ensemble featuring Shirley Jones, Buddy Hackett, Hermione Gingold, a very young Ron Howard, and of course, the quintessential Harold Hill himself, Robert Press Albright, who's the smart Asmodeus who's been messing with my video files. Yeah, there's also this made-for-TV version starring Matthew Broderick and Kristen Chenoweth produced for The Wonderful World of Disney in 2003, because that's what the world needed, a remake of a movie that was near perfection the first time, rather than an attempt to improve on the many, many, many properties that got completely screwed over on the screen. I advise you to forget about it and stick with the Da Costa film, which is exactly what I intend to do. Cash for the merchandise. Cash for the button hooks. Cash for the cotton goods. Cash for the hard goods. No, I have had enough crummy film adaptations of musicals I like. I am not putting up with this one. Look, what do you talk? 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 Where do you get it? The fella sells bands. Ah, too far, too far. You can talk all you want, but it's uh, I really hate living here sometimes. Fine. Let's examine the case of the Music Man. Since we've already seen a bit of Rock Island, that's a good place to start off the sin count. This is one of my favorite opening numbers because it has such a great concept. As a group of traveling salesmen discuss their jobs, their conversation mimics the sound of the train they're riding. Notice how in the Da Costa film, this idea is highlighted by the precise rhythm, strong accents, and heavy emphasis on the consonants. Why is the Model T Ford made the trouble, made the people want to go, want to get, want to get, want to get up and go? 7, 8, 9, 10, 12, 14, 22, 23 miles to the county seat. Yes, sir, yes, sir. Who's going to patronize a little bitty two by four kind of store anymore? Even if you close your eyes, you can still picture these men and the location just through the cadence of their words. It's a brilliant way of establishing the musical setting. The Disney version neglects the rhythm and accents in the number, losing the sense of a train in motion. Instead, they try to make it sound more like a natural conversation, which makes the repetition in the lyrics stick out like a sore claw. What do you talk? 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 Where do you get it? What do you talk? What do you talk? What do you talk? What are you talking about? Do you have Tourette's? Lest you think this scene is an irrelevant act opener, it also establishes our protagonist, Professor Harold Hill, a slick-talking con artist whose gimmick is organizing local boys' bands. Well, why should he get rode out of town on a rail? Because in order to sell band instruments and uniforms and instruction booklets, he has to guarantee to teach them kids to play. Well? And form them kids into a band with himself as the leader. What's wrong with that? You don't know one note from another. That's what's wrong with that. Look, it beats pretending he's a Nigerian prince, okay? The joke is that Hill has been in the car the whole time, unbeknownst to the others, but this part is ruined too, first by throwing in several not-at-all-subtle shots of Matthew Broderick's jawline, and then by overplaying the punchline. Harold Hill. That's him! It's you! You're him! You're Harold Hill! You're Harold Hill! Welcome back, Captain Obvious. Harold Hill disembarks in River City, Iowa, a typical early 20th century small town populated by your usual assortment of well-meaning but somewhat close-minded, stuck-in-their-ways small town types, who cheerfully sing about how unwelcoming they are. But what the heck? You're welcome. Join us at the picnic. You can have your fill of all the food you bring yourself. Lucky for Hill, his old accomplice Marcellus just happens to be the local hotel clerk so he's able to get the lay of the land. How are you going to start the pitch? Same old way. Keep that music teacher off balance. And my next step will be to get your town out of the serious trouble it's in. <laughs> River City isn't in any trouble. Then I'll have to create some. As well as establish Matthew Broderick as sin number two. I can see why they thought this could work, 
since Broderick's breakout role was playing a charming con artist. But the laid-back, nice-guy attitude that worked for Ferris Bueller is the wrong approach for Harold Hill, who gets people carried away by sweeping them up in his boundless energy. Nowhere is this clearer than his first big number, You Got Trouble, when he gets the River City folk whipped up into a think-of-the-children frenzy over the existence of the town's first pool table. Wilson gives Hill a fiery patter that makes him sound like a cross between a carnival barker and a tent revival preacher. One fine night, they leave the pool hall, heading for the dance at the armory, libertine men and scarlet women, and ragtime, shameless music that'll grab your son, your daughter, with the arms of a jungle, animal in Broderick's delivery sucks all the energy out of the song. You'd sooner believe he'd put the town to sleep rather than stir them to hysteria. But just as I say it takes judgment, brains and maturity to score in a balk line game, I say that any boob can take and shove a ball in the pocket. And I call that sloth the first big step on the road to the depths of degradation. as a first medicinal wine from a teaspoon, then beer from a bottle. His singing voice is wrong for the character, too, and it's not like Hill requires spectacular technique or timber to begin with. Robert Preston basically talk-sang his way through the part. But Broderick's voice is too thin and nebbish to convey the right sense of charisma and audacious style. In short, Harold Hill should not sound the same as this guy. I wanna be a producer with a hit show on Broadway. So Professor Hill has convinced the good people of River City that their children are in immediate danger of falling into the boss's clutches, and that only the wholesome allure of a marching band can keep the devil at bay. Of course, there are obstacles. The first is Marion Peru, the local librarian, piano teacher, and defrosting ice queen. She really doesn't have time for Hill's crap because she's busy trying to support her shy and speech-impaired brother Winthrop and her nagging mother. But, darling... When a woman has a husband and you've got none, uh, why should she take advice from you? Mm. Even if you can quote Balzac and Shakespeare and all them other highfalutin Greeks. The other obstacle is Mayor Shin, the local high muckety-muck who also happens to own the billiard parlor Hill has been vilifying. Shin is played by Victor Garber, who stalks through the movie like he's looking for a mustache and cape to twirl. I want that spellbinder's credentials. But here's the problem with playing Mayor Shin as a serious villain. He's not a character you can take seriously. He's a pompous blowhard of a small-town politician who's neither as dignified nor as eloquent as he'd like to believe. Garber tries to give the character menace, which is impossible when your dialogue contains lines like these. You watch your phraseology. You're unscrupulous. Flew by night. Not one poop out of you, madam. The thing is, when Mayor Shin is played for laughs, he becomes likable, which is important because even though he's an antagonist and has ulterior motives, he's also got a good point. Hill is untrustworthy, and the smart thing to do would be to check his backstory. And while we may want to see his ego deflated a little, we know that he means well and isn't necessarily an awful person. Garber tries too hard to make him the bad guy, which isn't a function the character is suited for. Actually... Garber's performance is a symptom of a more overarching problem with this version. The tone of it is very uneven. The Music Man is, at its roots, a very traditional musical comedy, meaning that it's light-hearted, stylized, and not overly concerned with realism. We are talking about a story where four non-singers are transformed into a barbershop quartet in under two minutes, and where the protagonist gets off the hook through a power-of-positive-thinking miracle based on a philosophy that he concocted out of thin air for the sake of his scam. Yeah, this isn't exactly a Sondheim character drama we're talking about. The Disney version doesn't seem to know what kind of musical it's making. Several of the big production numbers are very stylized, to the point of being surreal in places. Marian. Madam Librarian. But the more low-key songs and the dialogue scenes are played in a much more subdued, realistic fashion, almost to the point of being gloomy. True love can be whispered When lovers are parted, they say... 
As a result, a lot of the comedy falls flat and the more fantastic numbers feel strange and unsettling. It's like half the movie thinks it's ragtime and the other half thinks it's hairspray. So in between getting the bickering school board to sing close harmony and inspiring the mayor's wife to go into interpretive dance, Hill digs for some information on Marion. The local gaggle of gossiping biddies are eager to dish because they're convinced that Marion was offering her favors to the town's benefactor and also her intellectual bent must mean that she's up to something. not right for a woman to read. Soon she starts getting ideas and thinking. So naturally, Hill has all the more reason to think he'll succeed when he sets out working his charms on Madam Librarian. No apologies, no explanations, please. I'm only in town a short time and the sadder but wiser girl for me. I, on the other hand, am convinced of sin number five. The lead actors don't have a whole lot of chemistry together. Harold and Marion are one of those fictional couples that kind of fall in love in spite of themselves. He's just trying to seduce her so she won't blow the whistle on him, and she has him pegged for a phony pretty much from the moment she lays eyes on him, yet somehow they make a connection. Marion realizes that Hill's presence has made things in town better, especially for her and her brother, and Hill discovers that Marion is a lot more savvy than he'd taken her for, and he admires that. Robert Preston and Shirley Jones played the characters in a way where you believed in their growing attraction and how those feelings changed them. While Kristen Chenoweth does have some nice moments by herself as Marion, as well as an excellent voice for the music, she and Broderick don't play well together. She comes off as brusque and condescending, and he comes off as just creepy. Seriously, you could rescore some of their scenes and turn them into a stalker horror. <laughs> Neither of them displays anything that would attract the other in spite of their inclinations and their best interests. So when they do start to fall in love, it's abrupt and unconvincing. Surprisingly, slightly skeevy and reality-warping flirtation don't have the desired effect on Marion, but Hill makes some inroads by buttering up to Mrs. Peru and Winthrop. A stripe certainly, my boy. A wide red stripe on each side. What do you think of that? I think I need an adult help! But it's not until the Wells Fargo wagon delivers the band instruments and Winthrop's shy demeanor begins to crack that Marion starts to think, hey, maybe the pervy con artist isn't so bad after all. Sister, sister, if this is the most scrumptious this song gold thing you ever saw, I never thought I'd ever see anything so scrumptious as a scrumptious song gold thing. Oh, I think I liked Winthrop better when he wasn't talking. Everything's going Hill's way now, the town is all agog over the new instruments, and Marion's suddenly gushy all over him. All he needs to do is to keep up the band leader charade for a few more weeks until the band uniforms arrive and he can abscond with his ill-earned profits. Fortunately, he's invented a revolutionary teaching method that just happens to cover his complete lack of musical knowledge. But he never touches the cornet. Yes, well... He says you told him it wasn't necessary. Well, he tells me about some think system. If he thinks the minuet in G, he won't have to bother with the notes. Too bad Hill wasn't born a century later. He could have made a killing in the self-help market. Marion's not doing too bad herself. Hill's attentions have caused the gossiping biddies to act nice to her for a change, and she's so head over heels in love that she's about to Dutch tilt right off the screen. But alas and alack, a traveling salesman from the beginning of the movie has Chekhov gunned his way back into the plot, and although Marion is able to stall him from exposing Hill's charade, he's able to plant a few seeds of doubt in her heart. Who do you think you're protecting? That guy's got a different girl in every county in Illinois, and he's taken away from every one of them. And that's 102 counties! That's not counting the little piano teachers like you that he cozies up to just to keep their mouth shut. This causes Marion to abruptly swing back into giving Hill the cold shoulder again, but she ends up giving him the benefit of the doubt because, uh... Just that... But of course it stands to reason that disappointment and jealousy can lead to... to... Wait, wait, hold up. I'm going to have to call sin number six because we're missing a brief but rather significant insight into Marion's backstory. Remember the rumors the gossiping biddies were spreading about her earlier? She made brazen overtures to a man who never had a friend in this town till she came here. 
Right, that is supposed to have a payoff. Surely, if you would care to explain? I presume you're referring to Uncle Maddie. Uncle Maddie? Mr. Madison, my father's best friend. No matter what they say, he left that library job to me so that Mother and Winthrop and I could have some security. Now, why is this small section of dialogue important? Because it's a key factor in why Marion behaves the way she does. She's not just some repressed spinster who throws all her common sense out the window just because a guy starts paying attention to her. She has very real reasons for being closed off and distrustful of others. She resents being misjudged, and knowing how that feels makes her more willing to reevaluate her own judgment of Harold, who, like her, is an outsider in River City. She sees that he's more than his reputation indicates and starts to recognize him as a kindred spirit, even if it takes him a little longer to catch on, and that's what ultimately softens her heart to him. And while there's actually quite a lot going on in this plot, trust me, I haven't even touched on the mayor's daughter who's seeing a boy from the wrong side of town, or Marion's piano student who's sweet on Winthrop, or half the silliness with the ladies' dance committee, the movie could have certainly spared a few seconds to expand the character of its female lead. So Marion agrees to meet Hill at the local makeout spot during the big 4th of July celebration where... Professor Hill! We need you for the Shapoopy! I've been looking everywhere! Come on! Uh, never mind. It looks like we're doing this scene now. Shapoopy! 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 The girl who's hard to get! So, sin number seven, Shapoopy. And more importantly, how in the name of everything unholy do you manage to screw up Shapoopy? It's a song that has exactly one function, to be an entertaining song and dance. Even Family Guy understood that much about it. Shapoopy! First, it confuses the flow of the action. We get all set up for Harold and Marion's big romantic love scene, but instead we whiplash around into the company dance number. This is also a problem in the original film, since in the stage version the song takes place at the beginning of the second act. But the Disney version makes it worse by having this brief scene with Hill being all reflective by the footbridge before being pulled out of it. It's almost as if the movie forgot that it hadn't gotten around to the song yet and had to stop in the middle of the scene to wedge it in. Then there's the way the song is performed. A lot of the fun in the 1962 version of Shapoopy comes from Buddy Hackett. He sold that song like Vince Offer with 10 shows to do. David Aaron Barker, well, he's no Buddy Hackett. Walk her once just to raise the curtain, then you walk around twice and you make for certain. Once more in the flower garden, she will never get sore if you beg her pardon. And another thing, Mayor Shin looks to be enjoying himself way too much for the glowering killjoy he's been this entire movie. Okay, now we're getting to the big makeout spot tryst. Marion admits her feelings for Hill and surprises him by revealing she's always known him for a fake, but kept it a secret out of gratitude for the way he's changed her life. For his own part, Hill plans on leaving town that very night, but not before he gets his love duet on with Marion. And oh, dear Lord of Darkness, Broderick and Chenoweth do not blend well. There was love all around, but I never heard it <laughs> Meanwhile, Hill's cover has been officially blown, and the River Citizens are out for his hide. But Hill, as we all knew would be the case, has fallen in love with Marion himself, so he decides to stay and face the music. Hey, that was fair wordplay and I'm not ashamed of it. Everybody ends up in a big pseudo-trial at the school gym, where Marion argues that Hill's influence has made them all into better people, and Mayor Shin argues, not unreasonably, that since they paid for a marching band, they darn well should get one. How do they reconcile these two opposing sides in time for the big finale? Think, men. Think. Yes, they sound terrible, but that's the point. The parents are so proud of their little darling's first concert that it's the sweetest sound in the world to them. Again, it's not very realistic and kind of pulled out at the last possible moment. But hey, if you can't have a ridiculously happy ending in a musical, where can you have one? Disney's 
adaptation of The Music Man proves that you can have great material and talented performers, and it still won't work if you don't know how to make the best use of them. I suppose I do have to give them credit for trying to do a new spin on a beloved classic, but it misses so much of what made the original good that it never emerges from its shadow. My advice, again, is to go with the 1962 movie, which is one of the genre's all-time greats. But you know what? I don't want to punish this version. I want to thank it. Because like Harold Hill, it's given me something that it didn't even know it was selling. A clarity of purpose. You want to know why I do this job? Besides being forced into it after being exiled from nearly every other circle in the Inferno, I mean. This is why I do this job, because musicals have a hard enough time earning respect without mistakes like this clogging up the works. I love music theater. It's such a versatile and diverse form, yet it's still treated like the red-headed stepchild of the film industry, something only taken seriously by children, lonely cat ladies, and gay stereotypes. It can be, and is, so much more than that, and both the genre and the people who love it deserve better than this. And I might not be able to stop you from making terrible musicals, but I can sure as here enjoy taking the piss out of the results. So go on. Do your worst. Yes, even that. Bring it. Honestly, I hope you do right by the material this time. But if you don't, <laughs> I'll be waiting.